Hello everyone and welcome once again to TYA, a part tea party, part talk show where I get to sit down with the latest and greatest TYA or theater for young audiences professionals to talk about their past, present and vision for the future of this industry. My name is Kira and boy do we have a treat for you today with, um, with today's guest. She is the co-founder and artistic director of the Chicago's Children's Theater, as well as the creator of the Red Kite Project. She was formerly, formerly honored as the Hero of the Year with the Chicago chapter of Autism Speaks, as well as was recently honored as one of 20 women who shaped arts and culture in Chicago. Everyone, please welcome Jacqueline Russell. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> of course. Um, so, as you'll see, we both have our, our mugs today. Um, and I know you're drinking coffee because you told me before, before we started filming. But the, the question we're going to start off with today is, if you had to pick a tea, what would be your favorite type of tea? Oh, that's... Uh... That's tough. I, I, you know, I love iced tea and um, I think the best iced tea is that uh, there's a bittersweet bakery um, in Lakeview and they have uh, a vanilla iced tea mm -hmm. that is so delicious and very special. And so if I was going to have a special tea, it would be that vanilla iced tea. So. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah, my, my roommates and I recently switched over to iced tea from cold brew. Um, <laughs> to try to get all this caffeine out of our system um, <laughs> by switching to a different form of caffeine. So we'll see, we'll see how that works. Um, but <laughs> ice, tea is, ice tea is wonderful. Um, amazing. So to jump into the, the TYA portion of this interview, I would love to start off by asking um, why theater for you and why specifically TYA? What inspired you to go into this field? Mm -hmm. Well, I think my love for theater, like most of us started when I was very young. And I think my earliest happy experiences were making theater and going to the theater. And um, it just became such an integral part of my life growing up. And when I was a teenager, I got to go to New York City uh, on like a teen tour where I went with my drama troupe to see shows on Broadway. And that was it. I just thought there's nothing else in the world that I would rather do than be uh, making theater, being part of theater. Uh, and then I did a lot of other things. Uh, I did move to New York um, and then I did a lot of other things, um, but came back to theater, really came back to theater when I moved to Chicago and started working with children and really found the impact the theater has on young people is profound. And to me, it's just a way of uh, just building better citizens. Um, we have to be talking to children all the time. We have to treat children like the very smart, wise uh, people they are. And so I was very excited to be able to launch a company in Chicago that could do just that. And um, I just really wanted to uh, make an impact on Chicago and hopefully we've made an impact uh, beyond. Yeah, yeah, and I would, I would say you're making an impact. At least you are certainly paving the way towards what this industry can and dare I say, should um, strive for in terms of the possibilities of this industry, specifically with the Red Kite Project, which I know a lot of our viewers at home probably aren't familiar with what the Red Kite Project is. So um, would you be able to give us like a nice little snapshot of, of what that looks like? <laughs> sure. Uh, so when I, uh, many years ago, I was at Looking Glass Theater. I was their executive director. Um, before becoming their executive director, I was their education director. And part of my job was putting artists in public schools doing theater residencies. And there was uh, an autism classroom at a public school called Agassiz Elementary School. And I could not find an artist to take that class. And um, 
they begged me to, the teachers begged me to put an artist in there. And so I decided that I would do it. I was a new mom. I had a very small baby at home and um, just kept thinking about uh, what it would be like if I um, was trying to communicate with a child that was having communication issues. And so I really went at it with that in mind. And um, I ended up staying in that classroom uh, for about 13 years, um, all through my years at Looking Glass. And then when I started this company in um, 2005, I continued this work. And then I went to London. Um, I went and did a summer program with Tim Webb of Oily Cart and became very close with Tim and the team there. Brought them to Chicago and trained uh, a handful of artists here. And we started creating multi-sensory interactive theater pieces, very much from the um, oily cart model, um, but they weren't specifically autism. Um, I was more specifically autism, which was why Tim was like, no, we need to do this together in collaboration because you're the autism person. And so um, together we did that and we brought in a lot of experts, a lot of special educators. And pretty soon um, people were saying, what are you gonna call this? This has to have a name, it's something else, you know? And um, I was in love with a song by Sufjan Stevens called Sister. And there's a line about a red kite in it. And it just seemed like the perfect name for the work that we were doing. So we called it Red Kite. And now Red Kite is a big part of what we do at Chicago Children's Theater. And it includes those multi-sensory interactive programs. It also includes summer camps and artist residencies and professional development for teaching artists as well as for educators. And now we travel all over the country. Um, I've gotten to, I was named a cultural envoy to Canada to do this work um, with the State Department. And um, so it's, it's a big part of, of who we are. It's really, I'm happy to say it's in our DNA at Chicago Children's Theater. And um, even in the pandemic, we've been zooming, zooming away with our Red Kite friends. So, you know, it carries on, but that's Red Kite. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I love that. And what goes into creating these red kite experiences or red kite adventures, as I believe Chicago Children's Theater refers to them? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, we decided they were adventures. We started calling our, our actors guides. Um, we just really wanted um, for people to understand the interactive nature. Um, we didn't want people to think that they were just sitting and watching an actor perform, but that they were very actively involved. And so um, I tend to get very inspired by nature. So a lot of the pieces that I've created um, are sort of simulating nature experiences uh, where the children come, it's like 10 children at a time with a caregiver. And we're usually sitting in some type of a circle or an intimate space. And then we're taking them through a series of activities that are very sensory, very tactile, um, and very much um, whatever the child is inspired to do, they can do. And so we did one piece, for instance, called Red Kite by the Sea. And so it was like taking the kids to the seashore. And we had projections of the ocean and we had these big, huge jellyfish puppets and we had seal puppets that sang to them. And, you know, just all kinds of experiences as if you were going to the shore. And um, yeah, they last about 30 minutes and everyone that is involved in it is really trained to interact with the children and to get the children to be comfortable um, experiencing and interacting however they're comfortable doing that. That's amazing. That reminds me of, um, we have a, a theater company here at Northwestern called Seesaw Theater Company that does, oh, yeah. yeah, a lot of similar work with these immersive experiences. Um, I remember I had the pleasure of um, being like a proxy, a proxy um, audience member for them when they were developing one of their shows. And it truly, it truly was a, a wonderful immersive experience. Um, I loved it and it's amazing work. I am really um, appreciative of it and all of the, the work and um, thought that goes into those shows. It's really amazing. <laughs> yeah, people, people tend to do it with a passion. You know, it's a, it's a very different thing. It's a gift to be able to perform and create theater, but this kind of goes beyond that, I would say. 
Um, and it really, I think anybody who does this work, which it's now, you know, when we started it, there was really, there was nobody doing that work in the States. Um, and now there's, it just feels like it's everywhere, which is what it should be so that everyone can access this kind of work in their community. I think that was always our dream for that. And people who do it, it's, it's absolutely a passion and it's the most rewarding work I think that anybody can do as a theater maker. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I know that beyond the, the adventures, uh, Chicago Children's Theater also does access weekends where you do accessible performances of your main stage shows. Um, yeah, which is pretty awesome. And I know a couple of the theater companies on campus also incorporate that. Purple Cran Blairs does, which is the theater company I'm a part of, as well as Seesaw, of course. Yep. Um, thank you for that thumbs up. Yeah. Yay. Um, but I know we, we don't see those accessible performances in many theaters. Like it's not a staple in theaters yet. And I'm wondering um, what your th thoughts, what your thoughts are when it comes to why we don't see more sensory friendly performances in all theaters. Um, I think a lot of it is awareness. I think that um, a lot of theaters are maybe um, just don't know how to do it. Um, and I think there's a big desire to do it. I was really excited a few years ago, I was brought in by the Art Institute just to talk to their docents about um, how to create um, an accessible, sensory friendly um, experience at the museum. And uh, there was, I mean, it was a huge turnout. They were very excited. These were people who'd been docents at the Art Institute forever. And um, so I, I think that there's a desire to do this, I think most everywhere. I think it's really a matter of like, hmm, how do we do that? It seems intimidating. And I think that once people realize that through some very slight modifications, you can make a more sensory friendly environment. Um, I think the number one thing is just being a non-judgmental, welcoming environment. And if we can just all be better um, informed about autism and about that behavior and the experience that family might be having, that alone could make it a more friendly um, experience for them. So I, I think that more and more companies are doing this and I hope that more and more families will take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the companies that maybe haven't incorporated this into their seasons yet, do you have any recommendations about how they can get started or where they can turn for more information? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I think that it's just really important to get informed about autism. So even if you're just going to a site like Autism Speaks and you're just like um, learning about um, the, the needs of people with autism and even, you know, reading Temple Grandin's book, Thinking in Pictures, and just better understanding that a lot of it just really has to do with um, uh, comfort level and preparation. And so certainly, um, you know, we're always happy to talk to people. Um, you can certainly find things on our website uh, about our um, sensory friendly performances. And also I've had a lot of people from other theaters come and experience ours as they were developing theirs. So, you know, people are always welcome to come and, and see what that experience is like. But I think a lot of it is just getting informed. And it really, again, it's not, modifications don't have to be tremendous. I think you have to be careful um, about the choice of material. Maybe not every show you do is going to be the right thing to, uh, to modify. Um, but surprisingly, uh, the longer we've done it, the fewer modifications we've actually made to the stage show. I mean, Frog and Toad, you know, we took out Thunder and Lightning and when, um, when Baby Frog screams, you know, we took the screaming out. So we kind of modified that scene, you know, but really the show was the show and uh, they loved it. You know, they absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so again, we're always happy to be a resource to at Chicago Children's Theater. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> such all those theater companies out there, just reach out. <laughs> <laughs> and then outside of sensory friendly performances and um, all those possibilities there for this in industry to expand, are there 
other ways that you're excited for the TYA industry or the theater industry in general to expand? Um, or perhaps are there ways that the industry has expanded in the past couple of years that you are very excited about? Well, uh, I have a few responses to that. Um, you know, one is that um, we recently expanded by doing more work with blind and low vision children. And um, I did a residency again at a, an elementary school in Chicago called Otis Elementary that has what's called an LV program, a low vision program, and went in and did theater and drama games with them and really you know, got to start all over uh, and learn more about my own practice with the help of special educators who are specifically trained to work with children who are blind and low vision. And from that work, we ended up creating a piece with them in mind. You know, a lot of times access is, here's the show, now let's modify the show for the people with a disability. So we went at it saying, this is the show, it is for people with a disability and we're gonna modify it for people without a disability. So we basically built a show that would be accommodating for someone who's blind, but then everybody came to experience it and they could choose to wear a blindfold if they wanted to or not, because we wanted them to have the fuller experience, which we really believed was in not using your site. And so um, that piece was um, just really transformative, I think for me, for our company. We now in the pandemic, we've since done an audio recording of it with children this time. And the main character is a child from that program. And she was a huge inspiration for me to write the piece. So it was very exciting to actually have the real melody, play melody in the show. And for a child who has a visual impairment to get to be an actor um, was just, I think for both of us, a dream come true. So I hope that we keep expanding. I think theater in general um, is re really working on not only just expanding to serve an audience, but also to develop um, people within the profession who might have a disability, who have a passion to make theater, to have that opportunity to be a theater maker. And so I really believe that's a really powerful and positive direction to go in. And so um, that's something that I'm very happy and excited about, and I can't wait to do more of that. Um, and then of course, you know, now we find ourselves in a virtual landscape, which actually the virtual landscape made it even easier for us to do that uh, recording in a sense. Um, and so in some ways, I think that those of us that are continuing to make theater in this strange time are really getting very experimental and innovative and really interesting things are starting to happen. And I think that it was maybe inevitable that theater makers were going to need to somehow find a way to be in collaboration with this technology. So I think ultimately some good will come out of it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And in terms of this idea of expansion, whether it's expanding the types of theater we're creating for different audiences, um, such as, you know, blind or low vision audiences, as well as audiences on the autism spectrum, or the audiences who have sensory sensitivities, um, as well as just young audiences in general. Um, I feel like a lot of expansion comes from the new work that we're developing, uh, which I know that Chicago Children's Theater is a champion of, with over like 20 world premieres under your belt, I believe. Um, so that being said, I'm wondering what new stories are you craving or what elements of stories do you want to see more of? Um, yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, you know, we are very interested in, in diverse stories and we really want the work we do to reflect the children that are coming to the theater. And so, um, you know, in the last two years, uh, you know, we did Last Stop on Market Street um, directed by Henry Godinez from it. Um, and um, that piece to me was just a beautiful piece um, about a child in an urban environment uh, with his grandmother and seeing things maybe that he'd never seen before uh, and having an appreciation for that. 
Um, and so very much inspired by that work. Matt De La Pena um, is the author of that book. Christian Robinson is the illustrator. Um, we're looking at, you know, we have other titles of theirs that we're really excited about. Um, because I feel like, especially um, in our city, we have such a diverse population of children and we really need to keep looking for stories that are about them, um, that speak to them, that empower them, uh, that give them um, hope and excitement for their futures. So that's the work that we're really looking at. Um, over, the, um, over the spring of the pandemic, uh, we hired about um, 13 uh, playwrights, um, all um, BIPOC playwrights, um, to just dream and brainstorm what they would like to see on our stage. And the ideas were just as diverse as their talents and visions. And um, it was really exciting to, um, to be talking to these artists, many of whom don't make theater for young audiences. Um, but it was really great to ask them to explore that. And um, so I think that there's some really great, uh, great ideas that have come from that. And I think we're just gonna keep exploring that. And, and those are the voices that I really wanna, wanna see on our stage. Yeah, yeah. and with that, with that push for um, new explorations and all of these other um, thoughtful and intelligent um, new new ideas that you've been talking about throughout this interview. It, it comes as no surprise to me that the Chicago Children's Theater was actually the first theater for young audiences to win um, a National Theater Award from the American Theater Wing. That's really remarkable. Um, and I'm wondering what qualities about Chicago Children's Theater do you think lend it that title? Hmm. Um, I think uh... I always say to people, it's, it's because we're in Chicago. It's because we have an amazing theater community. We have, I really believe, the, the most diverse um, theater community in the country um, in terms of the people that are able to create theater in Chicago. And, you know, people can work in theater in Chicago and, you know, can make some sort of a living, which you cannot say that in a lot of cities in the country. And, you know, even in New York, I feel like you can work on Broadway. Um, but I would say that the type of work that we can do in Chicago is really unique. And I think that a lot of, um, a lot of people look to Chicago as a leader in this field. And so I think the fact that we've been able to create such high quality diverse work is because of the artists here. And then what happens is that all the other children's theaters in the country look at what we're doing, our work gets picked up and it starts to build a national reputation. And I think that combined with the Red Kite work, um, the fact that we were the first ones to start doing that and really um, the, the impact that we've had on the theater community as well as on the autism community, I think is something that has set us apart. Um, but I really, I just, we couldn't be doing this work that we do if we weren't in Chicago. So I just, you know, when I got the award, I just thanked Chicago. I mean, it's like, thank you, Chicago artist, because that's, that's where it all begins, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Chicago girl through and through. I've lived here my entire life. So I feel like I'm a little biased in saying that Chicago is one no, of the- it's, it's truth, it's not biased. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. absolute <laughs> truth. I mean, you know, I moved here from New York. I can tell you, there is not, it's not, New York is not like Chicago. Yeah. It's not. And so we do have, we have some, you know, we have a secret sauce here. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I'm so excited to make art here. It's it's truly a magical place in terms of the theater community. I would have to agree. Yes. Um, so, of course, there are so many challenges that come with being a, a theater company in this time in particular. And I'm wondering how Chicago Children's Theater has met the challenges of this time. And if there are any aspects that you think you may actually keep um, in terms of how you've had to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's been a really long, what is it, seven months now? And um, <laughs> now uh, talking to a board member um, the other day, she was like, you know, I think we all thought this was going to be a sprint, but it's a marathon. And um, I thought that was a really excellent way of putting it. And I think that we really did initially think it was going to be a sprint. And um, we were fortunate because we have a really committed board of directors that stepped up to help us as we had to cancel shows and cancel camps. And, you know, we were really kind of reeling from all of that. We wanted to pay everybody that we could. We were able to do that because of our board's contributions. Um, we kept people on as long as we possibly could. And then eventually, the longer you see this going on, the more every single, you know, institution is having to, um, shrink in size and so you know we're very small right now um but we even from day one we started working and i think that you have to keep working and we had to figure out that it was just going to be something different and so um we immediately within the first couple of weeks of the pandemic created a piece called frederick um which is based on the leo leone book and i was able to reach out to michael shannon um, because I woke up, I just heard Michael Shannon's voice in my head and was like, I really would like to get Michael Shannon to narrate this little children's book. And uh, a wonderful alum from in you, um, Debbie Bisno, um, put, put Michael and I in touch and uh, he immediately agreed to do it. And so, you know, from the, from the get go, we just stayed busy. And I really talked to the staff about how um, we have a job to do, which is to serve the children and families of Chicago. And every time something happens, we have to look through that lens and then we have to get to work. And so it really felt like we needed to create a piece that would inspire them and let them know that we're here and that we care about them and that we're not going to stop and that we're going to be here when we're all back together again. Um, in the physical world, but we have worked very hard to create a virtual presence. We have a YouTube channel now called CCTV. Um, we've been doing classes and we've had contests. Kids are making all kinds of fun videos and plays and we've been pr providing access. Um, if people can't afford a class, we make sure they can take that class. Um, and we're even now doing a um, a shared class experience with um, a drama group in India. So kids in Chicago are creating with kids in India. Um, so I think we're really embracing this situation and um, we are not gonna stop serving these children. And, um, you know, we have our Beatrix Potter drive-in theater experiences coming up. And, you know, we decided over the summer to film Beatrix Potter, our puppet show that we do every year for the holidays. And we made a beautiful little film and we're gonna project it in our parking lot so that a lot of little toddlers and preschoolers can have their first theater experience. I don't want them to miss that, you know? Um, so just really, we're just working hard to figure out how to reach kids where they are right now. And uh, we just won't stop. So. Uh, we've been super busy and in some ways you know our publicist said um he works for a lot of theaters and he's like chicago children's theater is the busiest theater in chicago <laughs> it's like we're just busier than we've ever been but that's because we have a mission to serve you know and we're really needed right now so we're just going to keep doing it and i i think you know i said earlier we're learning a lot and some of the things that we're learning are going to, I think, inform our work when we are back in the theater. Um, and I think that we are a lot closer to other children's theaters in the country now. We meet once a week as a, a cohort. We talk and we share ideas and we vent. And um, I think that the community is getting very close and small. And um, so I think that there are a lot of positives that have come out of this. Um, I'm particularly concerned about young people graduating from school and what is out there for them um, and how we can also serve you because 
um, you know, you're the future of making theater for young audiences. And I don't want you all to slip away either. So it's something that we also spend time as a staff talking about as well because you're also part of our vision and our future. That's a big relief for me personally. That, that has been worrying me a lot recently. Um, I am a, a fourth year in college right now, so I am graduating this year. Um, and also had friends who graduated just a couple of months ago when the chaos all started. So hearing that is a big relief for me. Um, but I also agree that this work is more important now than ever. I mean, with social engagement opportunities for young adults, particularly being so low, um, with school being online and not really being able to interact with as many people as before, I truly feel like having these theater opportunities online um, or socially distanced in very creative ways is very useful and very impactful right now. Um, yeah, yeah, so we appreciate it. We appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, and in terms of, I know everyone's kind of grappling with the virtual platform right now, but do you have any recommendations for theaters in terms of creating that online presence? Anything that you found particularly helpful, especially when it comes to engaging young audiences? Um, you know, it's really tough right now, honestly, um, because the children now are back in school and they have to be on the computer all day. And that is uh, not great. And so we're finding that parents are really wanting to get them away from the computer. Um, so I think that it's really about trying to figure out how you can create um, a virtual experience and at the same time, not be in front of a screen alone. And I mean, that's why we're really trying to do this Beatrix Potter experience because, you know, can we find a way to socially distance and share that virtual work, but as an experience together um, in a community? So I think that there has to be more thought into how to build community in a time like this. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just about getting creative and how can you inspire children to be creative on their own? Um, and I think that's why our contest that we created, uh, the Play at Home contest that we launched right when the pandemic happened. And if you go to our CCTV YouTube channel, um, you can see um, the kids' entries. We have like 36 entries, I think, and I'm, I'm not sure how many are still up on our YouTube channel, but um, it was really exciting to give kids a lot of instructions, um, but very simple ones, like you have to have a villain, you have to have a family member in your piece, um, you know, just uh, some basic little guidelines and instructions. And they went and they made something. And um, I think it was really important for them to be makers and um, for them to uh, get to direct their family members. Um, and uh, uh, so I think that there are other ways that we can keep engaging that maybe have a lot more to do with the child's creativity than our creativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is just a time of creativity for everyone. And I, I love centering ourselves around that during this time to, to, to get us through and get creative with everything. It's That's right. I mean, uh, believe me, I've like, how many people are like baking bread? I have friends that are like pickling things. I mean, you know, whatever it is, however you can like stay busy, express yourself, um, challenge yourself. And um, yeah, and I think for children, if we can keep getting them excited about theater making, then when, when we're all together, they're gonna wanna come back and, um, and really experience theater because it's going to be something that gave to them in this time. Yeah, yeah. And then when it comes to theater for young audiences, I personally believe that one of the keystones of this work is having that spark of hope. Um, and that being said, what is your spark of hope during these times? Hmm, that's a good one. Ah, oh, that's such a good question. Um, well, hmm, I, 
I guess one thing that's been positive and hopeful for me is that um, a lot of people who I've loved working with have been super busy and, you know, um, have been very uh, just busy. And I find that right now people are not as busy. They've slowed down somewhat. Um, and so even being able to have Michael Shan and have the time to go record a children's book, um, you know, in like a little pillow fort in his in his um, bedroom in Brooklyn. Um, and then my friend Brian Salznick, who's a really well known children's author who did the book, The Invention of Hugo Cabret. Like, um, Brian's like one of the busiest people I know. And suddenly, he was home and in his place in Brooklyn and we wanted to do something together. And so we made a, a piece um, called Dollface Has a Party that you can also see on our CCTV. And um, I wouldn't have gotten to do that with Brian um, if we had just all been about our business. And so I feel like um, the thing that gives me hope is that we're slowing down right now and we're reconnecting to our families and our friends and ourselves. Um, and we're, I think, realizing what's really important. Um, uh, and so I, there's a lot of things that I am scared of in our near future. Um, and I do a lot of worrying, but I do feel um, very hopeful for um, where we're going. Um, as individuals that I really hope that, that this is a time of evolution. Um, and anytime I get to interact with children, I mean, children always give you hope. I mean, if you just go watch those films, those little movies they've made on CCTV, if you want to feel hopeful, you watch the children because they have so much to teach us and we just need to listen. We can learn a lot from children. Yeah, I agree, which I think is why I've been so excited coordinating this Playground Festival of Fresh Works because we are generating new content to interact with young audiences and get their ideas about the stories that are being built for them um, by inviting three professional playwrights and creating these wonderful staged readings, um, including Let's see, we have Scaredy Cat Presents this year by Janine Sobek Knighton, which um, explores ideas of like social anxiety and um, our, our main character, Catherine, she uses a lot of breathing to get through, um, to get through all of those stressful moments when maybe she's grappling with that anxiety. And I understand that you've brought a gift for us having to do with mindful breathing and calming um, which is especially useful in, in these times of all times um, when things can seem a little crazy and scary um, and we might all be a little anxious, uh, finding those ways to, to center ourselves and calm down like Catherine and Scaredy Cat. So um, I believe it was called My Magic Breath, right? The, the beautiful video that you have for us. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um... So My Magic Breath uh, has come out of a partnership that we have with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Um, we started working with them, um, I want to say about nine, ten years ago, on a project with Yo-Yo Ma, which was just one of the highlights of my life. And um, we tried to figure out what we could do now that were virtual. So we really wanted to do a piece together that would really help children and their caregivers um to get through this time and so there's a beautiful book called my magic breath and it's all about just the power of taking a deep breath and we combined that story with beautiful animation from one of the artists of chicago children's theater and then the um we had uh i guess it's four principles from the um Chicago Symphony Orchestra, uh, who then played these beautiful Bach pieces. And um, all of that is woven together and you can just experience this piece. The, the first lady of Chicago narrates it. Um, and uh, we launched it the first week of school when kids went back to school. And we just know that everyone right now really needs to be reminded of their magic breath. And so, 
um, I wanted to share that with everyone. It's, um, it's just a gift from the Chicago Children's Theater and the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, just to say we're here. And uh, yeah, just we all just need to take a deep breath and take care of ourselves right now. Mm -hmm. And for all of you at home, you can find a link to that wonderful, amazing video in our description for, for this video. Um, as well as you can reserve your free tickets playground um, using the link in our description as well to our Eventbrite or any of our social media pages. You can buy tickets through any of our platforms so you truly can't miss it. Um, so come, you can come and experience Scaredy Cat Presents by Janine uh, Sovic Knighton or Wave Goodbye or Ash and Feather by our two other remarkable playwrights. We're so excited to have you. And I know that um, the children's, children's, Chicago Children's Theater, there we go, the name's up here in my brain, um, has the drive-in theater premiering with Beatrix Potter and Friends. And that begins October 1st, right? And it runs through November 1st. Yeah, yeah, amazing. So go and check that out, a fun drive-in opportunity. I mean, when, when do you get to experience that for the theater world? That's a, a product of the creativity of now, which is super exciting. Um, and you all should check it out. So with that being said, thank you again so much for coming in and talking with us, Jacqueline. It has truly been a pleasure. And thank you all at home for tuning in. We will see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Bye.